keep that up. You guys ready to rock back there? All right. <laughs> I won't make you come and sit down in the first few rows uh, like I do for my usual classes, but this isn't my class. So my name is Mike Hickner. Uh, I'm a professor in material science and engineering, and my field is polymers. And so I'm going to fill in for the guest lecture today uh, for Professor Zarzar. Uh, and there's a pointer probably somewhere. OK, so these slides will be posted. Uh, if you want to copy early, just shoot me an email, and I'm happy to send you the link. Uh, but I don't know how Professor Zarzar uh, posts her slides, so um, if you want something to look at, you can look at this, and I'll fill in things as I can. So you talked about polymer conformations last time, how polymers arrange themselves in space, and that's really important to remember because polymers, since they're macromolecules, are big objects, right? They're big globs, there's kinks, and there's nooks and crannies and lots of polymers. And so it's important to remember the physical picture for what polymers look like at the molecular scale. What we're going to talk about today are we're going to start on polymer solutions and blends. And so I'm going to define what a polymer solution is. I'm going to define what a polymer blend is. And so keep what you know in confirmations in mind as we go forward and think about uh, those same things in polymer solutions and blends. And so what you can think about in this unit is why do some things or some polymers or some chemicals or some liquids mix uh, and why others don't. And so we're going to talk about that. And what's the, what's the general rule that you have in your heads for why things mix or why things don't mix? What, what sort of strikes you? Polarity. Polarity, right. So polarity is a scientific word. What's the non-scientific word for why things mix and why things don't mix? Like, likes, like. That's right. So oils mix with one another. Uh, hydrophilic things or water mixes with one another. Uh, and so things that are like one another, two polar things will tend to mix. Two nonpolar things will tend to mix as well. But there's some real big details that we need to talk about. But keep that in mind. And in the back, you can keep your head up there so you don't fall asleep. Thank you. I'm looking at you. Yeah. All right, so you want to get uh, familiar with this table. And you don't have to memorize it, but you're going to see stuff like this in your engineering career. So this is called a chemical or solvent miscibility table. And the colors uh, tell us different things about these different solvents, right? Uh, and you can uh, read all of these compounds, and you can look them up and figure out what they are. But all of the blue squares here, and how you read this table is you have the intersection of dimethoxyl, uh, uh, dimethyl sulfoxide, or DMSO, and dioxane. Whoops, uh, yeah, right. Well, it's not right there. So uh, dimethyl sulfoxide and ethanol. Let's take this square right here. So here's uh, ethanol, and here's dimethyl sulfoxide. And the intersection of that is a blue square, and that's a miscible solvent, right? If we take pentane, and we look at this square, and this row right here is acetonitrile. So the intersection between acetonitrile and pentane tells us that it's immiscible. So you can look up what acetonitrile is. You know what pentane is already. And so acetonitrile is polar. Pentane is nonpolar. And so you have immiscible solvents. And then you have other uh, miscibility windows in here. So these are miscible solvents that are organic, not water-based. And so you have a different code. This is a really important table, because sometimes you want to dissolve polymers. Sometimes you want to make a solution. And this is a really helpful table. And this can be found on Google in 10 seconds. So keep that in mind. And these exist for polymers, too. I'll show you an example. So what is a polymer solution? So polymer solutions are basically liquids. Uh, so you kind of have an idea what a liquid is. And it's a liquid containing a small molecule solvent, like toluene and a polymer, like polystyrene. So polymer solution is generally just a mixture of small molecules and macromolecules. That's all it is, nothing fancy. They tend to be homogeneous. So it's a homogeneous mixture. You should know what that is. Uh, and uh, here's the rest. So make sure you know these vocab words. I'm big on vocab, especially since this is a lower division course. If you don't know the vocab, you're not going to have any idea what I'm talking about as we get to the hard stuff. Um, so generally, 
the polymer and solvent must be miscible. So what does miscible mean? Does anyone know? Go ahead. You, you can mix it, right? What's the opposite of miscible? Immiscible. Make sure you remember that. Um, OK, so you can read all this stuff. Polymer solutions usually have between 0.1 weight percent polymer or less and 10 weight percent polymer. What if you get too high in polymer concentration? What happens? It gets really thick, right? Really viscous, which is a scientific word for thick. So it's really hard to make a 50 weight percent polymer solution. It's really hard to make a 20 weight percent polymer solution. It's just hard to stir it. And so polymer solutions usually have this sort of composition, although uh, this is science, so there are exceptions uh, to everything. If you don't have a good solvent, you get uh, polymer dispersions, which is like a polymer colloid, or you get full-on polymer colloids, where all of a sudden the solvent isn't miscible with the polymer anymore. You get phase separation. It's not clear. It's not homogeneous. And you'll study those things later. Any questions so far? Good. So here's typical polymer solution. Toluene, which is this, and polystyrene, which is this. Why do these mix? Why are they miscible? Pretty obvious, right? They look the same. They've got those big benzene rings, so these things like to interact. They have a little bit of aliphatic content right here. Here's the methyl group. Here's the aliphatic backbone of polystyrene. They look like the same molecule, kind of, uh, even though polystyrene doesn't come from toluene. It comes from styrene, and you already knew that. But just examining these molecules gives us an idea that there's a good chance that they're going to be miscible, like, likes, like, right? Uh, do you think high N or low N polystyrene is more miscible? I'm referring to this right here. So what does the N mean in polystyrene in this picture? N stands for the degree of polymerization. That's right. So how many monomers on average are in a chain? And so you've studied all that. And so do you think low molecular weight polystyrene or high molecular weight polystyrene is more soluble? Low, right? It's easy to mix around small molecules. And so oligomers of polystyrene go into solution much more quickly and in some cases are more soluble than high molecular weight polystyrene. And we'll study some of the reasons why. Those people want to come in in the back? Come on in. <laughs> OK. Uh, what about the miscibility of polystyrene and acetone? So what's acetone? Do you know? So you can look up what the chemical structure of acetone is. It doesn't look like uh, um, toluene, right? And so it looks a lot different than polystyrene. And so it turns out that polystyrene is soluble in lots of things because it has so many conformations. This big benzene ring right here folds the chain of polystyrene all around. So polystyrene is slightly soluble in acetone. But you can think about the chemical compatibility if you know what the chemical structure is. Good. And I brought videos. You're not going to have any sound. Oh, maybe you don't even have a video. Oh, this is the worst. Sorry. I will post the videos. And so you, uh, well, maybe it'll go. Nope, not going to work. I'll post the videos, uh, and you can take a look at those. And uh, I suggest when you go home and study tonight, because I know that you look over all your notes at the end of the day, write down the things that occur to you, and formulate a series of questions or action items for the next day. You can look at these YouTube videos, uh, or you can YouTube Polymer Solutions, and there's lots of cool stuff on there. So I won't take your time with the videos. You can look at that uh, uh, at home. OK, solvents for polymers. This is a really interesting uh, scientific paper. And you notice solvent power for solvents for polyvinyl chloride. People paid for this research. And so back in the day, and this is 1964, when we were just learning about the properties of polymers, we needed to figure out what was going on in terms of how to solubilize PVC. So PVC is a really important polymer. Where do we use PVCs? Anyone know? Pipes. Turns out those little uh, squeezy dog toys, those are plasticized PVC. We use it in packaging. Some of those stretch films are PVC. And so we need to know how to dissolve and process PVC. 
And so this is just a figure from the paper showing the osmotic pressure over the concentration, and that's just a scientific thing. Don't worry about that. Oh, sorry, this should be, well, I can't write on my uh, computer, but this should be uh, uh, capital pi right here. And we basically looked at, or the people who wrote this paper, looked at different solvents. So this is THF, nitrobenzene, uh, whatever that is, uh, cyclopentanone. And they measured the concentration of the polymer in the solvent. And these are weird concentration units, right? Grams, or G in modern uh, CGS units. Grams of polymer per 100 milliliter of solvent. So even though you've never seen this paper before, and you might not have known what osmotic pressure is, uh, especially if I could get my nomenclature right, we could sort of figure out that people are looking at different polymer solutions with different concentrations. So one gram of polymer per 100 milliliters of solvent. Hopefully you know how to compute that weight fraction. Uh, and they look at this uh, um, osmotic pressure over concentration. It turns out you can measure molecular weight or solvent power this way. So you can check out this paper if you're interested in it. Okay, so that's the basics of uh, dissolving polymers in solvent. We'll go into some of the math in a second. It turns out that you can also take polymers and dissolve them in other polymers, and that's called a polymer blend. So instead of taking a small molecule solvent like toluene and dissolving polystyrene to make a liquid, we can take two polymers and we can make a blend out of them. And it, uh, in some ways, they behave the same, although polymers tend to be solid. And so a polymer blend is going to be a solid mixture of these two polymers. Uh, and these are not great diagrams, but they describe uh, two very important cases, and I'll tell you about them. So one of them we call a miscible polymer blend. You notice polymer A and polymer B, and these are really poor excuses for polymers, but let's just go with it. Polymer A and polymer B are homogeneously distributed in example A, and I can't write on my tablet here, and the internet is dead uh, in this room. And so anyway, this is a miscible blend. You can write that down in your notes right now, and as you're studying tonight, you can write that down on my notes that I'll post the link to. So this is a miscible blend because those chains interact. So polymer A and polymer B are in intimate contact with one another at the molecular level. We know that the diameter of a chain is really small. This now, if this is a miscible blend, what's this? Immiscible blend, right? These polymers don't like to mix. And so we have a phase boundary between polymer phase A and polymer phase B. And so we're going to study these two cases because oftentimes we make technical materials out of polymer blends or phase separated polymers. We often don't use just a piece of polymer by itself. So most products are blends or something like that. Okay. <clears throat> So a homogeneous polymer blend is also called a miscible polymer blend. You know that, and I'll tell you uh, now that polyphenylene oxide and polystyrene make a miscible blend. Why do you think that is? Got those big benzene rings, right? Got some methyl groups. It's looking pretty good. Polyphenylene oxide has an oxygen here. Oh, I don't know. Maybe that causes some problems. But it turns out there's not enough oxygen in PPO, or polyphenylene oxide, uh, in order uh, to make it two polar. So polystyrene looks pretty nonpolar, right? Although it's polar 